Senator Hussein, what a pleasure to see you. Thank you. You are already on your feet for 24 hours traveling all the way from Pakistan to China. Congratulations for an already successful trip. Well, thank you. It is, I have the excitement of uh, homecoming, so I'm not tired at all. Mm -hmm. It's a reunion with friends, isn't yes. it? It's a family reunion. Indeed. I was having the opportunity to sit in, in a closed door session between your delegation and the China Institute of uh, Innovation and Development Strategy. And I feel the atmosphere there. There was a lot of change of en exchange of energy from both sides. But what do you see are the most important points come to your mind and your colleagues in terms of discussion with your Chinese counterparts? Well, you know, uh, this is a very important uh, new think tank. And uh, for us, an important element of that was uh, Mr. Zheng Bieijian, who was personally present at the age of 91. And uh, no wonder he's called China's Kissinger, <laughs> because he was on his feet, he was active, and for four hours he guided the discussion. And the discussion was, a, I would say, a very high quality seminar on Pakistan-China relations, on understanding China, and also understanding the changes in the world around China and Pakistan, since we are neighbors. And don't forget that I first came to China when I was a teenager, and I've seen the evolution of China over the decades. So for all, also it's a huge transformation, and to learn about this transformation, what are the ramifications for China, for the region and the world. It was riveting, I would say. Talking about guru of wisdom, you are also the Pakistan guru <laughs> of wisdom in terms of China. You have been giving a wonderful description about what China is from your research. Would you like to share it with us? I came to China when I was 16 or 17 years old. And I was heading a young group, a youth group, Pakistan-China Youth Friendship Association. I used to listen to Radio Peking, so when we landed here, Pakistan Airlines was the first and only airline those days which used to come from the outside world. So it was, you know, they say the Forbidden City, a country which was, you know, poor, weak and isolated. Now it's rich, strong and a global leader. It was Peking Hotel or there's one other hotel called Xinjiao Hotel. The streets were empty, you could walk around, people in blue tunics and bicycles. But one thing which is constant is, the Pakistan-China camaraderie, the bonding, the brotherhood, mm -hmm. the cozy, intimate rapport that the people of the two countries have, the governments and the state, that has not changed. You have a good way of describing what China is to many of your Pakistani colleagues, a brief and yet very philosophical and historical way. Would you also like to share it with us? Yes, I feel that first of all, China is not just a country and uh, it's a civilization. And as President Xi Jinping rightly said, tell the story of China and tell it well. I said, let's understand China's strategic culture, the values, the worldview. So you know where China is coming from in terms of history, in terms of background, in terms of track record. And I said, there are three or four components which are key to China's strategic culture, as I call it, the Silk Road, which was the first instance in human history of globalization. 2000 years ago, starting from Xi'an, opening up commerce, culture, mm -hmm. connectivity among countries and civilizations and continents. So that's China. Outreach in a peaceful way. Then I said the Great Wall, it's huge. When the man on the moon landed in 69, they said, we, I could see only one thing on the earth, the Great Wall. And what is the Great Wall? It is protective. It is defensive. It is not against any uh, foreign country. It is to defend China from outside. So that is also the Chinese way. China has risen peacefully without aggression, without occupation, without colonization, without any attacks on any country. That's unique. And then I said the third component is the long march, which is a very key element of the Chinese revolution for one year. And out of 100,000 people, 20,000 survived. But what does it show? Patience, 
perseverance, persistence, right. never give up. And that's how the Chinese revolution was saved under Chairman Mao. And finally, I said the century of humiliation, 1840 to 1949. 1840 was the Opium War. Yeah, yes. yeah. And that's how it, the whole thing. And China was under foreign domination. It had lost its sovereignty. There was warlordism and foreign countries. The West, uh, US, Britain, France, Germany, they were exploiting China. Japan. Uh, Japan also dominating China. So China, that's why Chairman Mao said that today the Chinese nation has stood up on October 1st, 49. So that's where China is coming from. And today China is regaining the place which China had occupied 300 years ago when China contributed 30% of the global GDP. There was no America then <laughs> and Europe was uh, lagging behind. So that's, uh, people don't understand that history. And that's why we see this historical shift in the global balance of economic and political power from the West to the East in the 21st, the Asian century. And we feel China's peaceful rise is a source of strength for Asian countries and developing countries. Now think about today. The Belt and Road is celebrating 10th anniversary and Pakistan is an important component of the Belt and Road Initiative. And yet the efficiency of projects being developed uh, under the Belt and Road Initiative can be further improved. How do you see the possibility of that in the near future? Well, first of all, the BRI, Belt and Road Initiative, in my view, is probably the most important diplomatic and developmental initiative of the 21st century in terms of scope, in terms of scale, in terms of duration. And I remember I was at uh, in this very city of Beijing in uh, May 2019 at the second Belt and Road Forum. The theme was green development and I heard President Xi Jinping say that. So, and the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor has been the flagship of BRI and it has been transformative. Yes, there have been problems. Three years of COVID, they were lost. Difficulties, it was a pandemic. And then we have also in Pakistan, unfortunately, bureaucratic red tape. And sometimes there are security issues. And don't forget, there's geopolitics. A lot of countries don't like the BRI in the West. And some countries want to sabotage or undermine or undercut this cooperation between China and other friendly countries in Asia. But of course, as Chairman Mao said, nothing is hard in this world if you dare to scale the heights. So we are scaling the heights of progress, poverty alleviation, climate change, yeah. and uh, moving forward in people-centric development. Now you have brought all your colleagues from different political parties together, and they come here, they get a sense of what China is about from their own eyes, what they're really hearing. How much do you see further consensus can be built on both the efficiency, implementation, and the eventual results to benefit the people uh, that are covered by some of the projects related to BRI? You see, there's an English saying, seeing is believing. So now they're seeing with their own eyes. Not virtually. And not virtually. Not reading, not through a documentary. On the spot, meeting people, seeing projects, mm -hmm. seeing development, seeing progress. So now they say, this, uh, every system, every policy is judged by one factor, mm -hmm. results. Has that project delivered for the people? Have the people benefited? Mm -hmm. And when they see how China has benefited, the Chinese people have benefited. Their living standards have changed, which I've seen personally. 800 million people lifted out of poverty and so forth. And also, the skies of Beijing are far more bluer and cleaner than before. So, you know, uh, that uh, 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 climate uh, issues, uh, pollution is uh, far less so. That has changed. So, China is also playing a leadership role in climate change, in the environment and poverty alleviation. These are issues which matter to us also. Human development. Human development. And it's about human security, yeah. health and education. And the way China succeeded in combating the pandemic, it's a quite a, a big success story. I remember Mr. Zheng Bijan yes. uh, during the closed door session, he said something about the history and 
how it will be today's component eventually related to the history. He said that yet the best is yet to come. Yes. That is a very philosophical, shall I say, uh, a phrase that he used. But from your perspective, what is exactly the nature of change today? How do you see which stage are we in? What is the best way for Pakistan to be sophisticated, both observing and strategically participating and shaping to the mutual interest and certainly to your best interest? So let's look at the big picture. Yeah, the bigger picture. Yes. yes. What did President Xi Jinping say recently? We are witnessing once in a century changes. Changes that have not occurred for over 100 years are suddenly taking place. The global balance of economic and political power is shifting. You see the decline of the West. You see the rise of a multipolar world which has to work in a multilateral framework. Issues like coronavirus, climate change, they are there. The failure of military might after 9-11. So that has given strategic space to countries like China and Pakistan. It's all about uh, connectivity. It's all about cooperation. It's all about consultation. It's not about conflict or containment or confrontation or a cold war, which some want. And we are the hub of regional connectivity, Pakistan, because of the China-Pakistan economic corridor. Central Asia, South Asia, Gulf, Iran, Afghanistan and China together. So that's a new world opening up. Ports, pipelines, roads, railways, energy, economy, education. You name it, all these are there on the agenda. That's the future. And that's the big picture. So we are on the right side of history. Moving towards a better tomorrow for Asia without overlords and without any underdogs. Mm -hmm. And not going back to a mindset of Cold War or zero-sum game or en enmity or containment. That has no place in the 21st century Asia because that would be too debilitating. We have seen uh, you know, many of the projects built between China and Pakistan have been realized over the years, whether it's about roads, or it's about uh, uh, international trade center, or many others. Uh, how do you see the locals have come to understand the nature of this cooperation? You see, I've been chairman of the parliamentary committee on CPEC, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. So I've been visiting projects. In fact, in fact, last week, I took a delegation of parliamentarians to a project which is called uh, at Karot, which is 720 megawatts. Mm -hmm. And it's again a success story. They're benefiting the people. So 200,000 Pakistanis got jobs. 40,000 Pakistani students studying in China. Uh, over 6,500 megawatts of electricity generated. Mm -hmm. 1,000 kilometers of roads and highways built. These are apparent and $29 billion of investment. So the early harvest projects have more or less been completed on schedule. Yeah. So the best of CPEC is yet to come. Now we're talking of agriculture, education, IT, special economic zones, relocation of Chinese industry. So a lot is going to happen. Mm -hmm. So we have to, as I say, get cracking mm -hmm. and move forward. I would say the special economic zones because they are going to be the key component of that. What does the economic zone do? The economic zone would be in three or four different places. Say, one would be specializing in a particular element. Say, high-tech right. technology. Some would be in uh, consumer goods, for example. Something else on mineral development. Mm -hmm. So there are different components. And some may be on uh, food security and agriculture. So all these zones have to have an area of specialization. And that's how we have to take this forward. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, so I would, I always say the best of CPEC is yet to come. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just the beginning. Pakistan is a very young country in terms of demography. Because 66% of Pakistanis are under the age of 35. And it's also, we have a large middle class, over 100 million people. English language is very important. So access to computers internet, IT, and uh, young women, young men playing that role is, uh, I think, uh, a very key element. And I feel that our best resources are human resource. 
talented youth, boys and girls, and very creative, and who can get things done. So they need to have the opportunity to demonstrate their talent. And that opportunity is providing by CPEC, because China has already at par or excelled with the United States in high tech anyway. Having said that though, what about this China-Pakistan relationship? Of course we say it's ironclad, huh? uh, just to describe how uh, resilient, strong, and enduring it is. But having said that though, what does that say? Particularly today when you have a population of 35 years and even younger, 60% of them, some of them may not necessarily know the you know, earlier stories of uh, friendship between China and Pakistan. How are you trying to bring the literacy of China and China-Pakistan relations update to them? The relationship is being refreshed, revitalized, rejuvenated. How? How? CPEC, for example. Mm -hmm. It's only 10 years old. Then issues which matter. China's core interests. We talk of China's peaceful rise, sovereignty issues. Pakistan is standing firm like at the Karakram Mountains. And when it comes to Pakistan's sovereignty, unity, territorial integrity and dignity, China is there like a rock with us. So mutuality of interests. We are opposed to hegemonism. We support non-interference. And we reinforce each other's core interests. And that is the key. And plus, that is supplemented by a very strong and resilient grassroots bond between the two peoples, yeah. which our delegation, the parliamentary delegation I'm leading today, mm -hmm. is reinforcing. Mm -hmm. Having said that though, how do you look at the regional cooperation that is taking place dynamically now in Asia? Uh, you have very different uh, mechanisms, for example, mm -hmm. Shanghai Cooperation Organization, in which um, Pakistan also plays an important part. How do you see all these regional groupings, mechanisms, how will that contribute to the diversity of streams of thoughts and also clues for future relations between China and Pakistan and beyond, of course? You see, a very important development is taking place in our region. Asian hands are shaping the destiny of Asia. Let me give you an example. The rapprochement between Iran and Saudi Arabia. For 30, 40 years, there was this unbridgeable gap, a conflict, a yawning chasm between Iran and Saudi Arabia. And China played the role of an honest broker. And now you can see rapprochement between Syria and the uh, other countries, mm -hmm. China playing a role in that. Then this uh, summit uh, between Central Asia and China, then CPEC, then these pipelines, then Central Asia cooperation, we are the hub of regional connectivity. In all of these developments, where is the West? It's all regional countries taking the initiative. That's a very positive sign. And that shows that Asian countries are taking the initiative. Not just Iran or Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, Turkey, other countries. These are middle powers and they feel that uh, this is where our interests lie and they want to promote those interests through diplomacy, through investment, through trade and commerce and connectivity.